Okay, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> All right. So let me just stand here, I guess. So uh, hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here to talk to you about a topic that I'm very passionate about, and I'm hoping that you are too, or else you won't be here. So a quick show of hands. How many of you have already you know, transitioned over to an Agile process? OK. How many of you are kind of in the middle thinking about it? OK. How many of you have not moved, but you know, you're here to start to think about it? OK. That's a good, interesting mix of people. So imagine you are part of a team or part of a, a leadership team that's been asked to transition over to an Agile process. Now, if you're like me, you'll be excited because you now have an opportunity to shape the future process. You now have an opportunity to have a say in how you do your day-to-day -day activities. Now, if you're like me also, you'll be a little bit worried, a little bit anxious, perhaps even stressed, because you want this to be, at the end of the day, a success story. You, want this to be, you don't want this to be an ordeal that people have to go through. Right? In this state of dichotomy, where you're excited at the same time worried, you sometimes wish there was a sage that came and sat you down and said, yes, I'm, let me show you the way. You know, a sage like a tall, good looking, you know, long hair, long beard kind of a guy with a white outfit comes and sits with you. Seems like somebody who knows what he's talking about. Well, I'm none of that. I mean, look at me, I'm not tall, I don't have hair. You know, some people would even consider me not good looking, and by some people I mean everybody except me. So uh, I'm not that sage, but the good news is that having done a few transitions uh, over my career, uh, I have developed a few patterns that I believe uh, would work in any institution. And that's what uh, we're going to share over here. So by the end of the talk, you know, you'll will, you will have those ammunition, those tips in your hands to be able to Again, do a, a great uh, transformation with amazing results. And most importantly, enjoy the journey itself as you're moving through this process. A little bit about myself. I started my career at Oracle. Uh, I, I, I started as an engineer, moved to the role of an architect. And I was with Oracle for six, seven years when I moved to a startup called Vantage. Uh, and depending on how, what you define as a startup, it was a 90-people company at that point. But we took it from 90 people to 400 people, eventually got merged with Starsight. I did that bit for six, seven years or so, uh, you know, combining on Vantage and Starsight, and then joined Teleo. One year into, or a little bit over one year into Teleo, Oracle came and bought Teleo, and I found myself back in the mothership. Um, now, a little bit about Oracle is that Oracle is a very, very big company. It has 140,000 people in, this, uh, in, in, their, in their payroll, and they have a lot of lawyers, bunch of lawyers, right? In fact, just the other day I heard that Oracle is actually a legal firm that also does software. So when you deal with so many lawyers, you tend to develop this annoying habit of uh, giving disclaimers. Some of them are useful, like the one I'm showing over here. Some of them you just throw out there because you can. Okay? So just understand that this is all my opinion, not oracles. So what to expect from this talk? I'm going to take you on a journey uh, of the last transformation that we did at Oracle. And the very first thing I'll do is I'll set the context for the product, the people, the process. And then we'll talk about the changes we made. We'll also share with you the results that we obtained. And finally, we'll talk about the tips that made this uh, successful. So let's get started. So a little bit about the context, about the product itself. How many of you know who, what Teleo does? One, two, four. That's four more than I expected. That's good. Uh, so Teleo is in, this, in, the, in the talent management space. What it means is we help organizations acquire talent and we help organizations kind of build a pipeline of candidates, post your jobs online, and uh, you know, manage your interview process, offer process, onboard candidates to employees, and then manage the employees' you know, performance and all that good stuff. The whole talent lifecycle is managed in Teleo management, in, 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 in Teleo, basically. So we are, Teleo Business Edition in particular is a leader in its space. 
uh, uh, we have 47% market share. In fact, uh, our next three competitors combined do not come close to our market share right now. We have 5,000 customers on this platform, and we get close to 90 million transactions a week on our platform, and uh, with an average response time of less than 240 milliseconds. And we are truly a software as a service vendor in the sense that we have only one version running at any point uh, in time. Uh, so all of our customers are running one version, and when we upgrade, all of them upgrade on the same night. So that's a little bit about our uh, product itself. Uh, about the team, it's pretty much North America-centric team, but we do have presence you know, in Canada and Europe, uh, particularly in Poland. So we have all the challenges that you would expect to have in a distributed team. This is our current process. Sorry, this is our process before the trans transformation. So as you can see from the process uh, diagram over here, it's a waterfall uh, or waterfallish process where you get where product management comes and throws a spec at you and developers you know, get busy architecting the solution and implementing it. Uh, quality assurance people eventually join the, uh, join the flow. And everybody marches towards that code complete milestone. And when you go there, what happens is that a lot of the big features or big deliverables often end up getting delivered towards the end of that uh, you know, life cycle. So QA struggles to get that going. Uh, they have like two weeks from code complete to code freeze to get something from unstable to completely stable and certified for production. And therein, you're, you're asking for some trouble right there. And one of the challenges you'll, you'll, you'll anticipate by seeing this diagram is that at the time of code completion, the developers and product management moves on to the next release. Quality assurance people stay behind to make sure that they are certifying this release. And you introduce this multiple focus problem right there. So here, product management and developers want to move on to the next release. QA is saying, not so fast. You, know, you have bugs over here as well. So you have this inherent inefficiency in the process where you are trying to context switch. And when you're doing that, you are not having as good of a quality as you'd expect to have. And some of the uh, bugs slip through to the production. And as a result, we spend a good amount of time, even after the release, trying to stabilize the, ex uh, the, the previous release. So almost five weeks go by before you are ready to focus or, or have that single focus once again in the next release. This creates a lot of unhappiness in the team because it, people feel like they are running, running, running all the time and they're still falling more and more behind, right? And they don't seem to have one focus at a time, right? They are they're constantly switching focus and as a result, they're being inefficient in the way they do things. So at the, at the heart of this discussion is that, you know, there, there were a lot of business variables or business uh, drivers for this change, but at the heart of it, it was really the team wasn't happy. We needed to do something to make sure that, you know, team feels productive again and, and they feel like they can make a difference without having to sacrifice their work day, a work life balance. So what were the changes that were made? So uh, we adopted the Scrum methodology within the Agile world. And I'm not going to go through the Scrum methodology over here. I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with it. But just to set the baseline, this is, this is the kind of typical Scrum process that we would follow in our world. And then let's talk about the after picture. You saw the before picture in terms of process. Let's focus on what are the key changes we made in the after picture. Uh, the main focus of this diagram is how did we instill a very uh, a one single focus for our team. So the the process starts with something called the product development sprint. What we do there is all the major feature enhancements or technology upgrades, the things that are riskier in nature to begin with, we take them on in the first four sprints. They're divided into two-week sprints. And as you would expect with any sprint, the sprints are self-contained. So you take on a story, you fix all the, I mean, you, you implement the story, you fix all the bugs, you meet all the acceptance criteria, and that's when a story within that sprint is complete. That's what you do in, in, in PDS1, PDS2, PDS3, and PDS4. In the, in the fifth sprint, you would focus on the bug fixing alone. Again, to step back just a little bit, 
I was talking about single focus. So in the PDS1, for example, product management, development, quality assurance, all of those people are very much focused on one thing and one thing alone, and they're all starting at the, on the same time. It is, there is no longer QA coming in late or developer coming in late, none of that. Everybody is focused on one thing at a time, and that's it. So similarly, when you get to the fifth sprint, everybody is focused on bug fixes. Now, just to make sure we are understand what I mean by bug fixes here, is these are not bugs that are generated by the stories in the earlier sprints. These are bugs that were always there in the product. These are customer found defects uh, that we, we just need to fix. As you know, I mean, you're doing enhancements, but you always have a backlog of bugs that you need to worry about. So you're coming here and fixing those bugs in the fifth sprint. Why is that? As I said, that I want to take the bigger risks earlier in the risk uh, earlier in the process, and then I want to take I want to taper down the risk as we move forward in the in the release. So towards the end of the release cycle, we're taking on bugs which are inherently a little bit lesser in risk. So th that's what we're doing in the in the BFS. And then the the last two weeks is the product uh, PRS product release sprint. It is where you basically invest your energy in packaging and deployment and basically running your integration tests and giving QA enough time to do or go beyond your basic tests. In the previous process diagram, you must have seen that we had two weeks to not only stabilize the features but do all of that. So now your stories are already accepted in the in the development sprints. Your bug fixes are already accepted within the bug fix sprints. These two weeks are purely there for advanced testing, for corner case testing, for integration testing, things like that. So as you can see that by doing this, you obviously get a lot more quality uh, built into the process. And finally, once the release is out there, you have RSS, which is release stabilization sprint. So we kind of anticipate that before we get started on the next release, let's understand that this release may cause some issues. Let's slow down and make sure that we actually address those issues before we move on to the next release, because otherwise we'll end up having that multiple focus once again. We want the team to start something together. We want the team to end something at the same time. At the same time. Now, if there is an inherent incentive built into this process, if the team does a great job, this one week might be nothing, meaning there might be no issues on production. And at that point, you have that natural cadence built into it where you can slow down a little bit before you start up again. So this is a very sustainable uh, uh, you know, way of running things, right? Is there a glass of water I can have somewhere? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I hope this is not st steel water. Okay. And then you start all over again for the next sprint, hopefully having had that little bit of relaxation between the PRS and the RSS. So let's talk about the results that we obtain before we talk about the tips itself. So I'll go through a series of metrics that we collected over time to understand how well we are doing. You can see from the over here that you know previously, before this process was put in place, we had many patches right after the production. Right after, right after we released the production, we would have a lot of patches going on. And after the release, after this kind of a process that we put in, that dropped down dramatically. Similarly, you might argue that, okay, you might have consolidated all your patches into one, but you must be putting a lot of bugs there, right? Just to debunk that theory, I wanted to show this slide over here, which is basically the number of defects also that we put in a patch was reduced. So not only were we doing less number of patches, we were doing a lot less number of bugs in those patches as well. P1 defect has a special meaning in our world. Uh, it actually means that you know, we have to turn around. When some something we acknowledge as a P1 defect, we actually have to turn it around within five working days. So it has a special meaning, and that also reduced dramatically after we did this process change. Finally, what matters is our customer satisfaction, right? as to, actually not customer section, but let's say our support organization, who has to deal with support incidents as soon as a release goes out. And the way we look at a release is not exactly the way support looks at a release. We might have introduced only two regressions, let's say, but that may have resulted in 500 escalations from a support perspective. 
Whereas I, we could have done seven regressions and we might be feeling really bad about the release, but support might have gotten you know, sporadic uh, calls from different customers because that didn't really impact too many people, for example, right? So we, we wanted to devise a metric that would give us the health of the release from a support perspective, and this is what that is. So we have this total number of incidents that come in a week, and then we also want to measure how many of those came in because we just had a release. And if you look at the before picture, there was a substantial increase in the SRs, or the uh, service request, after the release, within the, uh, the, the previous process. But after the process changed, even the SR volume got lower, it almost became a non-event. Nobody even really knew that there was a release that went out. Customer satisfaction also went up, just the way it shows on the graph. So over time, this had a happy ending all around, including the team that was unhappy to begin with. Right? So now that we've talked about the results, let's talk about, you know, um, by the way, this is just another disclaimer that I wanted to show you. This is the, the picture on the right is how I looked before the first transition. And it's basically after, the, uh, and after I do the first transition, without the tips that I'm able to share, that's how I look. So uh, it's important to understand those tips, otherwise you may end up looking like me. So um, let's talk about the tip number one. So one of, the, one of the basic mistakes sometimes people make is, you know, Agile is very known in the industry right now, and most people understand the value of it. So when you, you know, think about making this change in your organization, you often feel like, this is a no-brainer, you know, everybody understands it, we'll just go and you know, talk about it and it'll be done. Uh, it often is not the case. There may be a good proportion of, I mean, good majority of your team and the stakeholders that might, might bite in, buy into it without even having to be sold about it, but there will always be a group of people, there will always be maybe one key individual that needs the selling, that needs to be convinced, right? And that's the point over here is that if you don't want to have that discussion in an unprepared manner, you want to have the, the most complete set of information and the most compelling business case first time around. And in order to do that, you should talk to your stakeholders upfront and basically you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and understand where they are mentally as to, you know, are you open to this process change and what are your reservations, what are your objections, and note it down and when you are in that boardroom situation where you're presenting or you're pitching this idea that we need to move to an agile uh, you know, process and whatnot, you need to um, have all those objections in your mind so that you don't have to think on your feet and deliver a response against those objections. So you will be much more prepared. And in the, in the odd case where you know, everybody is completely bought in and you went there fully prepared and nobody asked any questions, that's great. Because down, even though you might feel like you over-prepared for it, down the road, there will be somebody in your team, or maybe the entire team would have similar questions, but now you're fully prepared. And the way I have organized the tips in this presentation is it's not in the order of importance, but it's, it's kind of how you'd uh, approach them as you move through this transformation. So it's more like a timeline-based uh, uh, or order over here. So, Let's skip to the next uh, tips. Another thing that I, I found very useful is that a lot of times you feel like you know half the team already knows Agile and half the time half the team maybe not very familiar with Agile right now. So maybe this group of people can teach this group of people and you'll be done, right? The challenge that is challenge there is that Agile is understood by everybody differently. Everybody understands the jargons, I guess, but they interpret the meaning of it very differently. So you almost need to have a process where you can together unlearn everything that you know about Agile and then relearn it together as a team. Another benefit of this, I mean, going through a training together uh, is that it's all, I, I don't know how many of you have attended any Agile training, you'll see that it's very experiential. You're actually doing some fun projects together and you're working with this person that you may not get along very well, but in the context of that project, you are having fun together because that's how it's meant to be. So you kind of take that and say, okay, it'll be very wonderful to work with this person or this group of people in a similar setting. You know, Agile can make it very fun for me. So if you go to a training together, you first of all unlearn some, some of the things. You can actually relearn some of the jargons in the same manner, experience it together, and whatever doubts you have, whatever debates you have, you can have an expert 
kind of resolve those differences for you in that training itself. So if somebody has a question, they can ask that question and everybody in the room can hear that answer and either they're convinced by it or they will ask follow-up questions, but you have an expert talking about it. So as a result, there'll be little more buy-in and you know, it might actually resolve future differences right away. So that's another tip. <coughs> if there was, excuse me, I'm going to. I was actually sick last week, so it's a residual effect. Another thing that really, really worked for us, and if there was one thing that I would say, you know, take away from this talk, is this particular tip. When you're starting on this transformation, you know, and you have gone through the selling part of it, and you have gone through the part where you have now invested in training for everybody. So by, you know, you have the selling done, you have the training done. Now you want to adopt the, uh, the Agile or Scrum methodology for your own team. You want to come up with a blueprint because you can't just take it as it is. You have to adopt it to your organizational needs. Now, when you're doing that, it's very important to not have a single person do it because then it becomes that person's process as opposed to a team developed process. So one of the things that I suggest you do is you form a transition team made up of people from every function and every location, especially if it is a distributed team. So you may have a member from a QA team, you may have a member from a development team, your architecture team, you know, um, product management team, and in our case, we had team from, I mean, we have a representative from Poland, one of, we have a representative from US. So you put them together and make it, uh, and make it uh, that group's problem to come up with a blueprint. The advantages of doing that is that you'll have more than one person thinking about the changes and you'll, have, you'll bring in a lot more perspective into the process. If only developers were working through this, they might only think about the problems developers face. But if you bring in QA to it, if you bring in product management to it, and every, you can now look at the process from every angle. And, and hopefully there'll be more ownership because it's not, again, one person coming up with it. It's six, seven people are coming up with it. And one of the things that also happens in this is that there is this cross-functional appreciation that starts to generate. Uh, I have had situations where, you know, developers would come and tell me about, I didn't realize that, you know, product management did so many things before the release in terms of communication with customers and, and so many things you have to be worried about uh, when you are doing a release. Similarly, product management would come to me and say, I didn't realize that we had such methodical approach to QA quality assurance. So now people are talking to each other, people are understanding each other's concern. It kind of builds uh, the team spirit a lot more if you went around uh, you know, having a group of individuals owning the blueprint. Uh, one more thing that I, I forgot to mention is that when there is resistance from the team, let's say we develop this blueprint and we present it to people, and all of a sudden somebody from QA or PM or dev is you know, uh, asking a question or not agreeing with something, it's perfectly okay to have a debate, but <coughs> you get a lot more credibility if somebody from their team is answering that question. So that is another advantage of having a cross-functional team do this. Uh, the fourth tip is, you know, using an agile approach to do an agile transition. So we already talked about forming the transition team. Um, give me one second, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a terrible throat problem. So we already talked about the forming the transition team. Then what we did in our world is that we actually assign actual agile roles or scrum roles to people. I became the product owner who wrote actually the stories for transition. So the only difference between a, a product team doing, you know, developing product versus a team that is developing an agile process is that instead of developing a product, you're developing a process. So you could still write stories for that. And uh, so we created a backlog of stories. We actually configured the tools. So we are using Atlassian tools, and we would have to do that anyway for our regular teams. So might as well get a head start and um, start building the tools that we need. 
And we also prepared all the Agile boards that we required to figure out the burn downs and everything else that you actually track in an Agile process. And we also did the sprint review meetings. This is where you take it one more step further in terms of getting buy-in and making it, you know, making the ownership go beyond that group also. So what we did was every week, it was a week-long sprint where you, you would come up, I mean, you'll work on the stories and you'll come up with a decision as to how you'd resolve the story. <coughs> and then you do a sprint review where the entire team would come together and review your decisions or review your approach and give you feedback weekly basis. Now that means that they don't have to wait till the entire process is over before they can give you input. They can give you input right away, every week incrementally. So now you're not only <coughs> having seven people or eight people driving this process, you're getting the buy-in from the entire team and in every, uh, on a weekly basis. So by following this, this methodology, what you're really doing is you're actually validating the process you're creating on the go. So by the time, and, and, and if you have done Agile, you know that it takes a few sprints for you to get a hang of this new process. So by doing this as part of the blueprint creation itself, you are validating your process as you move forward. Uh, this is just an example. I mean, so we had created close to 30 stories for Agile transition, and I couldn't really put a lot of description over here, but these are the things that we were worried about. For example, you know, how do we form the team? We have you know, this many people in this many different locations. Let's figure out, uh, let's create a story for creating a team, as simple as that. But let's also figure out how do we deal with vacations? How do we deal with shared resources? How do we deal with you know, meetings? So there are so many things you need to think about in order for you to have a smooth transition. I would rather invest that time upfront as opposed to you know, figuring it on the go because people will come back and say, this was not very well thought through. But having all of these things thought out before the change would make your journey much more smoother. This is just one example of a transition story that I wrote. If you notice, it follows the exact uh, template that you would follow for a regular Agile story for a product development story, for example. Right? So you, you, would, you would follow the story definition, the acceptance criteria, all of that. Tip number five is document your rationale for the decisions. Now, I talked about 28 different stories that we actually worked on before the transition. Imagine having to remember all of that, right? And oftentimes, you yourself will forget about it in, in weeks, right? So by documenting it at any point, if you have ever doubts about, okay, why did you even choose that way? Or some random person walks up to you like, I don't like this, I don't know, I don't know why you chose this, this is stupid, right? You can always go back to your documentation and re-justify what you did. I'm just giving an example. So this is our wiki space where we actually started documenting all the decisions we made around the story. So something as simple as when to start the sprint itself. You would think that's a no-brainer. It's a you know, half an hour discussion and you'll be done, right? That was not the case because our initial reaction was, okay, we'll start on Monday, we'll end on Friday. Right away, the Poland team would say, well, your Friday is my Saturday, that's not going to work, right? So we started going through each and every day and basically figuring out the pros and cons of it and documenting it and then saying that looking at the pros and cons, we believe this is the right way to go. We actually went from Thursday to Thursday. That, that made the most sense for our team. Now, if somebody were to ask this question, why the hell did you pick Thursday as the start day? You know, it's very hard to remember all of it all of a sudden, right? So, but if you have it documented, you can always give them a link. This is the thinking process we went through so that you don't, you don't have to remember everything, especially not, not on your foot. Uh, these are some more examples of you know, the things that we have had to worry about. We already had a set of meetings that we were conducting. How do they change as part of the transition? How do we deal with internal defects? Okay. So all of those were you know, well thought through. Now, one of the things I wanted to also uh, in, in, um, push for here is that I don't want to jump into the process thinking that, okay, I've taken care of 60, 70% of the issues. We'll just figure it out on the, along the way. That will happen regardless, even if we thought through everything, there'll always be something that will come up actual, when you're actually going live with this process. But I didn't want to leave anything that we could think of uh, that we should have talked about uh, for the future. We wanted to talk about it. One of the things is, you know people are going to take vacation. You know they're going to go fall sick. 
you know there are special events that happen. How does it impact your you know, sprints? So we wanted to have a process for that. So uh, especially like emergency patches. You know, just because you're going on Agile and you're going on this release, the process that I showed over here, over there, doesn't mean that there won't be an issue that customer needs a patch right away. So how do we deal with that distraction? So we put in some thought around that just to make sure that we are not thinking on the fly when that happens, we are, plan we are prepared for it beforehand. Similarly, uh, you know, what does vacation and sick days and all of this mean for the different roles? If it's a scrum master, how do we deal with it? If it's a product owner, how do we deal with that? If it's a regular team member, what do we do about that? We thought through each one of those scenarios, documented it, made sure everybody thought that that's the right way to go, and that's when we closed it. Similarly, you have architects. You may not be able to afford an architect per team. This may be a shared resource. Or you may have an external resource like cloud operations. Right? They are not part of your team, but for this story to happen, you may need to have hardware provision for you or a software deployed in a certain way for you. So those are dependencies. How do we take care of that? How do we depict that in our boards, in our you know, tooling? All of that, we, we put in some upfront thought into it. Engineering initiatives. Now that we have a common backlog and one backlog uh, for the product, how do we make sure that they are interweaved with our engineering initiatives? So we have to have one priority list, so we have to have a way of figuring out how does our architect work with our product manager to weave in engineering initiatives within the product priorities. Seventh tip is about not be so dogmatic about Agile. Now, there are, even in this room, I'm sure there are Agile purists and I respect them, um, but at a certain point, you need to understand that we're not building a process for a process. We're building a process to make our businesses successful. So if that's the case, in a certain cases, without violating any of the Agile principles, you bait it to compromise here and there a little bit. I'll give a few examples. Uh, it's a big no-no to have your manager as the Scrum Master, because Scrum Master is meant to be a peer, meant to be a part of the team. Uh, but we couldn't really do that because we didn't have any program management office, a separate program management office where I could just plug one Scrum Master and do that. We also didn't want to sacrifice our individual contributor's capacity by having one of the individual com contributor become Scrum Master. It will take away from our ability to deliver more and more features. So we kind of chose our managers, but we swapped them around so that hopefully that they are not reporting to each other but in, in a way, our managers become the Scrum Master. Not the ideal solution, but something that we are willing to live with. We also did weekly demos as opposed to, uh, you know, usually you have a sprint level demo. So if your sprint is two weeks long, you did the demo at the end of two weeks. But we had a process already, even before this transition, where we were doing weekly demos. So we figured we'll just keep it that way because more feedback is actually better than less feedback. So we made compromises there as well. There are some more, uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Um, number eight is, I think Agile only works when you empower the team. We, I mean, this is one way of uh, scaling your team because there is no top-down push. Like a team actually commits, team actually does everything, and you're kind of a bystander as a manager. So you really need to mean it when you're saying that you want to empower the team. So what that means is, in our case, First of all, when we were building the blueprint, we took representatives from the team. And we made sure the team bought in to the process. They had a say in it every week, so that if they didn't like something, they could have a say on it. And the team formation was also, I mean, decided by the teams themselves as to how they want to self-organize. Similarly, the name came from their side. The most important thing I want to talk about is that they decided their working process limit and they committed to stories. And initially, it may, I mean, me being part of the management, it may be very uncomfortable, the number of stories that are being committed. But if you really believe in you know, empowering your team, you have to take a step back and, 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 and wait for the team to mature and, and figure out their velocity. So my point is that it will make you very uncomfortable initially to let go of the control to the teams to decide you know, how much they want to work on, what they are willing to comfortably commit to, and 
only when you do that, you'll realize after a few spins that they really own their deliverables, that they really own the commitment. Otherwise, those commitments come from you and they're just delivering against your commitment, not their own commitment. Right now, it's their own words that I will deliver this as opposed to their manager saying they will deliver this. Uh, we obviously make many of the tools available to our developers and QA and product management to make our lives easier. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through that one right now, but <laughs> uh, this is one of the tips that I learned this time around particularly is that you think that you have sold it to everybody, you have trained everybody, you have designed the blueprint and you got the buy-in from everybody, so you kind of drop your guard. You're no longer really worried about selling the process anymore. But there will always be this one person that is still dragging their feet. And they want to um, ask you, in, in, the, in the form of question, they're going to kind of really question the, the process itself. Because when you talk about, let's move to Agile, as an idea, it sounds good. It's good for my resume, I'll get along. But then as it starts to happen, you see the real changes happening, you get into a discomfort. You get into a, out of your comfort zone, basically. And that's when you start to have this subtle resistance. And this is where I think the number one tip also comes into picture, where if you had prepared well for some of those objections early on, now you can use those same arguments to battle this kind of late uh, uh, resistance from one person or two people or whoever that's coming up. And one of the things we had was, hey, there's too many meetings, we need to revisit this process, right? Not realizing that these meetings were happening even before, we're just formalizing it right now. Things like that. Uh, and anticipate that, you know, with any change, initially it, 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 the, you go through a little bit of a dip in motivation or, or you feel like, oh my God, things are changing and it's not looking good. But over time, if you, if, you, if, you, if you stay committed to it, you'll come out you know, feeling better about it as the time moves on. Last tip is basically, as a promoter or as an evangelizer of uh, this process change in your organization, you really need to strike a balance between you know, optimism and scaring the shit out of people. Right? So you don't want to go out there and say, it's going to be all good. It's going to be perfect. You know, whatever problems you have, you won't have tomorrow because you're going to be agile. You don't want to be sounding like that. You also don't want to sound like, oh my God, sky is going to fall tomorrow, right? You need to really start, you know, have a balance. Obviously, more leaning towards the positive, or else why are you even prom promoting this, right? So you need to be on the positive side. However, don't sell it too much because there will be trouble. There will be slowdown. In fact, uh, initially, agile slows you down in my mind because you're still learning the process, you're still learning the ropes, so it will slow you down a little bit. But then, um, basically, uh, it starts to get better. So set, I'm not saying set a very low expectation and beat it, but set very realistic expectations, and then you'll, 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 you'll deal with some, um, it'll be easier for you to manage that expectation. So finally, um, let's talk about the key takeaways where, so, uh, first thing I think that worked for us is the single focus. When everybody in the team is working on the same thing or same type of things, it makes a whole lot of difference because not everybody is pulling you in different directions. Everybody is going in the same direction, rowing in the same direction. Obviously, you get better efficiency. So if there is one thing that you take away from this, um, you know, as you're designing your own process, focus on a single focus uh, you know, process, and I think you'll get a lot of benefit out of it. And another thing I wanted to make sure you took away from this talk was do not design the process change by yourself or assign one person to design the blueprint for your team. In, be very inclusive in, your, in the design of the process itself. And you want to take a very incremental approach to the process change. You know, you don't want to have a big bang change that, okay, today we are doing this, you know, uh, the process in the earlier fashion, and then tomorrow it's going to be all agile. You want to go through it, you, do, you want to give it a bake time. You want to go through a few cycles before you are ready to, a few cycles within that transition team before you're ready to take it on for the entire team. 
<coughs> if you want the agile process to be successful, and in fact it's agile or not, if you want your product to be successful, you want to empower the team. And please mean it when you actually say it. And finally, you saw a lot of the results that we shared. We were measuring our <coughs> before picture as well as after picture so that we can actually objectively talk about it to everybody that's involved in this transition. So if you do that, um, if you do the measuring, you'll be able to actually objectively say whether you're doing good or bad, right? Uh, that's it. I apologize for my voice. <coughs> I actually cut down my talk a little bit because I knew that if I went on the normal way, I, I would not be able to finish the talk. So really apologize. I'm, I'm, I was I traveled from US yesterday, so I really felt sick. Uh, so, all right. With that, um, I think if there's any question, I'm happy to answer. Any questions? Yes. Sorry. Oh. Whoa. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> That's not me, I sure. Uh, sorry for your short. I um, just wonder if you, through your career, you had probably several agile transformations. And uh, when you, you can say that uh, you succeed in that, and which was the longest one, like about, about period? So you're talking about in my career, I've yeah, done a few yes, transitions. You, yes, yes, yes. Longest one meaning from the start of thinking that I want to go to agile to actually being agile? Actually, probably this is the one, I'll tell you why. Because it took me two years from the time when I was trying to convince my upper management to say, okay, let's go with this process change to the point where we actually did this, right? Two years, but I think one and a half year was just convincing my boss. Yeah. So after that, it, it was downhill. Okay, thanks. You have to go out with him and just, come on, let's do a jail. <laughs> By the way, I forgot to mention, uh, what's the deal? Uh, anybody who asks the questions gets it? <laughs> so, you get it. <laughs> All right. Any other question? No more books. So no more. <laughs> okay, so, thank you All very right. much. Thank you.